Hi everybody, Michael Davis here. Welcome to Bone to Pick. And before we jump into uh, this month's outstanding interview with the great Ed Neumeister, just wanted to say this is our 75th interview on the Bone to Pick series. We sure appreciate you guys uh, checking us out all the time and supporting us. Uh, keep sharing us on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and wherever you can, turning it on to your students and your colleagues. Uh, hopefully we can do 75 more of these. We sure appreciate all your support. Enjoy this month's interview. Hi everybody, Michael Davis here. Welcome to Bone to Pick. We are coming to you today from Newark, New Jersey and the home of our featured artist for the month of December, the great Ed Neumeister, uh, a longtime friend of mine and a person that I've been a fan of for, for many, many years. It's just great to have an opportunity to sit down with him today. Uh, he is a, uh, an esteemed composer, conductor, instrumentalist. He's been at the forefront of the jazz and creative music scene for over 40 years. Uh, early on, he had a, a, a flourishing career in the San Francisco Bay Area, playing every style of music you can possibly imagine, from uh, Jerry Garcia to the San Francisco Symphony. Uh, in 1981, he made the move to New York City, quickly becoming one of the top called jazz trombonists and, and studio session players. Uh, he spent 19 years with the Mel Lewis Jazz Orchestra, 15 years with the Duke Ellington Orchestra. He has toured, recorded, and performed with a myriad of artists from Jerry Mulligan to Frank Sinatra, Aretha Franklin, Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughan, even the New York Philharmonic. Uh, he has developed a, uh, a substantial career on the uh, European jazz scene, starting from the early 90s uh, and going to this day. Uh, he's, for many years, was the professor of jazz trombone at the University of the Performing Arts in Graz, Austria. Uh, he has been actively leading his own groups uh, since his days back in San Francisco. Uh, he has recorded seven albums as a solo artist and a leader. Um, and I uh, have to say, on a personal note, I was a, a high school student, about as green as you could be, and, uh, and fancied the idea of becoming a trombone player many, many years ago. And Ed was the top call guy we all looked up to in San Francisco. And uh, I remember getting the first chance I got to play with Ed was in uh, the legendary Bay Bones trombone ensemble right, yeah. with the great Billy Robinson leading it. And, uh, and so it's, it's really a treat. And I should also mention, I'm uh, super happy to hear that uh, Ed has now joined the SC Shires Company as one of their uh, artists, uh, a company I've been with for many years and uh, looking forward to seeing that relationship flourish as I know it will uh, in the coming years. But uh, without further ado, Ed, thank you so much for uh, inviting us into your beautiful home here today and, and for taking the time to talk about your uh, extraordinary career. Absolutely, thanks for coming. Let's, uh, let's start right, you know, your years in uh, San Francisco. I know you had a, a, a substantial career, but even before that, uh, I had a great time looking at some of the photos of you as a youngster, and, and I could, you just had a passion for the trombone at a very early age. And I, and I loved seeing that you played a J.J. Uh, Johnson Mac the Knife transcription for the halftime of the Ra Oakland Raiders. <laughs> Talk about a different era. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but obviously you had a, a gift at a very early age. But uh, just tell us a little bit about your memories of uh, what, what drew you to the trombone and to music. Well, the early days, uh, I found a trumpet in my father's closet. That was the really beginning. And uh, he had played a few different instruments, but he had not, he wasn't a musician anymore. He played in the, I think the army band or something. Um, I found this trumpet and fiddled, this is when I was five. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, cool. And uh, then I switched to accordion for a couple years. And then, um, not sure exactly how it came about, but I ended up joining a marching band in Oakland, California, called the Waldonians, when I was nine years old. And then, uh, yeah, the rest is kind of history. <laughs> it was a great, scene, we, we rehearsed every Saturday from 9 o'clock in the morning to about 9 o'clock at night and then performed wow. for the, all the parents in the evening. And, and in between, we would do marching drills but also play different styles of music. And then also, on, I think it was Thursdays, that you, have, you would have private lessons and they had what, what they called stage band which is once you worked your way up, I started as 14th trombone. <laughs> and then over the course of time, I worked my way up to first, or second and first. 
And once I got up into the upper echelon, which really didn't take that long, uh, I ended up in the stage band. And okay. we were playing the music of Stan Kenton and Woody Herman and other bands. Okay. The interesting thing is nobody called that jazz, you know? Right. Uh, I didn't hear the word jazz or never associated. It was just music. And then uh, through that whole thing, I ended up playing these uh, transcriptions of J.J. before I knew who he was. They just, oh, really? Yeah, wow. I was like, just here, learn that was in the music. Wow. Very cool. <laughs> wow. So how was that? The actual, do you remember the playing at the Raider game? Like, oh, I do. <laughs> because this was, yeah, uh, this was the very first football game at the Oakland Coliseum halftime show. So it was monumental and it was still when they had these and we played their halftime shows this what this marching band wow so we marched out to the center of the field <laughs> and then i came to the front of the band together with a tuba player and an accordion and i played the mac the knife <laughs> solos i think i was 12 that years old awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah let's see if we can get that for next year's super bowl instead of justin timberlake yeah, we're gonna really. have ed play the uh, <laughs> jj johnson it's solo. a little different these days <laughs> That's awesome. Well, and maybe uh, talk a little bit about. I know you went to San Jose State, and it was very, uh, really strong trombone program there with Bob Zabo being the teacher, and right. lots of good. Our, our old friend and my first trombone teacher, Phil Zahorsky, was there then. And talk yep. a little bit about that that time from, uh, from well, there. Well, San Jose State days. Um, when I went to audition for Zabo, I I had always been kind of the best musician around, so I was kind of cocky. Okay. <laughs> Thinking, you know, yeah, I got it. You know? yeah. And I went and I played for him. And he was like, nah, I don't know. Uh, I'll take you, but you're on probation. You wow. Know? So he kicked my ass, you know, right there from the get-go. Uh, I was playing on this still on my marching band horn, you know. So okay. he, he basically said, go buy a Con 88H. He gave me the phone number for Manny's Music. And I, and I bought a Con 88H. And uh, he was a great teacher. And yeah. my fellow students were uh, Phil Zahorsky and John Russell. Sure. And yeah. Esther, well, Phil, we lost a few years ago, but right. until then they were, and John's still active on the scene. As, mm. And together with Zabo, it was a great, a great three years. Um, and I was playing in the big band at the time in the school. There was no jazz department per se, but we played big band music. Don Ellis and some JJ things, and different. Um, and I was studying composition with Lou Harrison, the great uh, American composer. Mm. But uh, after three years, Zabo more or less said, you know, um, go study with Mitchell Ross. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm done with you, go see Mitchell, <laughs> basically. And, uh, but I wasn't, um, this was during the Watergate, Nixon, the Vietnam War. And I kind of got fed up with the state of politics uh, in the country. It's not so dissimilar to what's happening right now. Right. <laughs> and I bought a one-way ticket to Paris when oh, I was wow. 21. And ended up living in Amsterdam for a couple years. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. And this was a great experience for me. I was just woodshedding. That's uh -huh. when I really got into studying super and jazz. Okay. Uh, I happened to live in a place where I could practice all night long. Um, it was a, what they called a cracked house, rent-free. <laughs> uh, I had a panoramic view of Amsterdam. Wow. No electricity, though. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Slight drawback. <laughs> but wa running water, no hot water. Uh, yeah, you know, so you figure out a way. I had gas lamps and everything. But I could practice, so I did that more or less around the clock. And that really, that's when I really... Uh, that's just that was my uh, woodshed. Okay, yeah, awesome. And that was about two years time. A lot of playing, a lot of gigs, uh, but all creative jazz gigs. And at, then you know I was still like 23 years old, and I realized I was you know one of the best, or certainly one of the better players in Amsterdam, and it was time to go back. Okay. San Francisco and, and start studying with Mitchell. Yeah. So that's when I moved back to the Bay Area, 1974. And then I was on the Bay Area, the San Francisco scene, and, until I moved to New York in 1980. Let's talk a little bit about the San Francisco scene. Obviously, I have a, a strong affinity for it, having grown up in, in San Jose and, and, uh, and studying with Mitchell Ross and Zabo. And uh, I, 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 mean, I want to hear your take on it, of course, but Mitchell was 
for my money, the best trombone teacher I ever had. He was just an yeah, amazing, uh, amazing yeah. musician, and and sadly we lost him as well. Uh, yep. But uh, but he certainly made his mark. But uh, maybe talk about uh, what the San Francisco scene was like then. I love seeing those photos with you playing with Jerry Garcia, and I know. But then I know you also played with uh, San Francisco Ballet and the San Francisco Opera and the Symphony in Sacramento Symphony. I right. you, so you right. were. I remember it very vividly. Everybody was like, oh, Ed Neumeister's the guy. He does it all. You know, he's the top call for everything. And you were. Well, nobody and, and, told me that. <laughs> <laughs> but you were. And, and, and I know that, uh, and you delivered on, on all those levels. So, um, but anyway, what was, the, what was the scene like for you as a professional player in San Francisco? Uh, well, it was really a fantastic experience because I was able to just follow my dream, you know. Mm. Uh, you know, I played a lot of gigs with your dad. Yeah, sure. Uh, and I was working every kind of job that you could work as a trombone player, and uh, especially when I was in the, you call it, upper echelon. Uh, I played first trombone at the Circle Star Theater for a few years. And this is where uh, it was just an amazing experience where we played for Sinatra for a week, and then Ella would come in for a week, and then uh, Aretha for a week. <laughs> And on and on and on. You know, it was about 13, 14 weeks a year, but every gig was a week long. Nancy Wilson, Sarah Vaughn, I just went on and on. And uh, it's, it's a little like the Westbury Music Fair here, where right. it's, a, it's a theater in the round. And the pit, you could look at the, the artists. So it was a theater in the round, and the stage rotated, and the pit rotated with the stage, and so we were looking at the stage. So not only were we were playing this great music with these great artists, but I could really watch them, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I learned a lot, you know, listening to Sarah Vaughn sing every night, you know, or, yeah. and all those just amazing. Not to mention the band was great, the music, the arrangers, it was always the top. These were all the Vegas acts that were coming through in those mm -hmm. days. Um, and then at the same time, I was playing with Jerry Garcia and the Sacramento Symphony. Uh, and Noel Jukes. Uh, Noel Jukes is a multi-instrumentalist uh, legend in San Francisco, and I was in his band for this whole time. Um, and so I was hanging with the cats, you know, yeah. basically, you know, yeah. and playing and learning. <laughs> because I didn't really go through the education system like a lot of people do. I just learned on my own, and so I was just hanging and playing, on-the-job training. Yeah. It was the best. But Mitchell Ross was a huge influence. Uh, I agree with you. Best trom Well, I didn't take so many trombone lessons in my life, but uh, he was monumental, what, what he uh, communicated. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, yeah, I know you know. Yeah, oh, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think about it all the time. You know, we lived even close together for a while, and just remember sitting in his studio um, and the advice he gave and what to listen to, and it was just everything. So this whole experience was, uh, for me, just like heaven. Uh, although it came to a point, I was still in my, now at this point, kind of late 20s, and I was playing at the best gigs in town. Yeah. And kind of looking around at the people that are actually my age now, but the 65, 60, 65, the guys that have been on the scene all the years, all those years, and um, I kind of said to myself, I, I don't want to be that, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I need to keep growing. And I have this uh, desire to be creative. Yeah, certainly. Uh, and more than a desire, I would say, you know? Uh, and so the, the question is, okay, where do I go next? And the choice was clear. It was either L.A. or New York. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be a little stereotypical, you go to L.A. to make money, and you go to New York to make music. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a little cliche. Mm -hmm. There's nothing against L.A., and we, we could talk about it later. I was there for five years, too. Uh, but I, just, I came to New York to visit. I stayed with my friend Chuck Metcalf. You remember Chuck, sure. the bass player? Yeah. And I stayed for 10 days. I went to three clubs a night. Uh, and by the second day, I mean, there was no doubt in my mind You're that coming. I'm moving to New York. <laughs> and yeah, so. Well, that's great. I didn't, and that's exactly where I wanted to go with it. Cause, uh, and that's when I kind of really uh, 
got to know you better and, and, and in a way like uh, kind of like saw you t take that path, you know, and it helps all of us, you know, when you see somebody, you know, making that jump. And it is, it's a big uh, commitment. And I know you've always been so committed to creative music and so passionate about it that uh, clearly that's the right place for you to go. Maybe talk a little bit about uh, your, your early years in, uh, in New York. I know you told us a great story uh, before we started the interview that I think would be worth telling again. <laughs> Back when there were cigarette ads, which of course don't exist now, but uh, um, I don't think they exist now, right? No, I don't, I don't think, think so. so. But um, there was the cool cigarettes, and they had a whole jazz uh, musicians campaign. And I remember coming to New York when I was a student at Eastman and seeing you plastered all over the place, these big billboards with the <laughs> Ed across the thing, playing it cool, whatever it was said or whatever. But anyway, I, I, tell us a little bit about that because it was just a great story and then we can talk a little more about the, the actual music part of things. Yeah, well this, this is really my early days in New York, so I was just getting started in New York. I, I had enough friends and contacts that I was, start, I was working almost right away, uh, you know, Latin gigs and, and, mm -hmm. what, uh, and doing jam sessions and just uh, working my way onto the scene and then the great saxophone player Pete Yellen, we were at a session one day and he said to me, uh, not just to me, but everybody in that room at the time, there's an there's open call for musicians for this cool cigarette ad. He gave me the number, I called, and uh, I went down for the appointment and they took a couple snapshots, I said thank you very much, and then they called back a couple days later <laughs> and said, uh, you got the gig, come down, we'll do a photo shoot, and I had to get a manicure. <laughs> and uh, they had the suit for me to wear and everything. And then I, uh, we uh, did a photo shoot. And actually, they were really nice. They gave me a lot of the original photos. I have a book of all the, without oh, wow. all the ad uh -huh. stuff on it. And the, the, the quotation was, there's only one way to play it, comma, ah, cool. Right, right. Now I remember it. Yeah. And they used, there was a lot of jazz musicians that were also in the same campaign, Slide Hampton and uh, George Young, uh, Marvin Stamm, I think. Uh, but for some reason, they used my photo picture a lot. And uh, a couple of the famous ones are <laughs> top of Herald Square, or above Macy's, <laughs> big billboard. And the other sort of mind-blowing thing was for a while, I was on the side of every bus in New York, profile. I remember seeing it on a bus, <laughs> yeah. I had some <laughs> pictures of three or four buses in a row. It's <laughs> crazy. And, um, and I was new in New York, so most of the players in New York didn't know me. And that's how I, I became the cool guy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <Yeah. laughs> that, that is awesome. Yeah. Any, any product that's going to use trombone as their main source of advertising yeah, is really, going to be with okay the, with me. Holding the horn right. Yeah. Holding the, yeah <laughs> Usually like you, you see these ads it. and they have the horn backwards yeah, or something, right. you know. <laughs> Well, speaking about the music side of things, let's uh, maybe talk a little bit about, I know you were active in all facets of, of the New York scene. When I came to town, you were doing, uh, I think, Starlight Express or something, and you were gracious enough, along with Keith O'Quinn, to get me in there a little bit. But you were clearly active in the studio scene, the Broadway scene. But one of the things I have the strongest association for, with you is, is with Mel, yeah. Mel, the great Mel Lewis Jazz Orchestra, one of the arguably the greatest uh, jazz band of all time, but certainly one that would uh, garner those uh, level of attention. Anyway, maybe just talk about the impact Mel had on you and that, and that band, all the great players that were a part of that. Yeah, that, I mean, speak about heaven, so my heaven just followed me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now, when I first came to New York, I started out with Lionel Hampton for a while. Okay. And in Lionel Hampton's band, my section mate was Curtis Fuller. So, and Frankie Dunlap was playing drums, and a lot, it was a really a great band. So that was also heavenly. I'm hanging out with Curtis Fuller. With my, one great. of my heroes, yeah, you know. Yeah, sure. And so that was amazing. And then Buddy Rich. Right, I know Reese Spencer. And then back to Lionel Hampton, and then Mel Lewis. Um, and the Mel Lewis is interesting how it came down, really. Um, there was, we'll call it a shakeup in the band. Brooke Meyer was the music director. And uh, Mosca called me and asked me to come down on a Monday. And so I played. And at the end of the night, he said, can you come next Monday? I said, yeah, I can come. And the next Monday, he said, can you come next Monday? <laughs> and so it was like three or four Mondays like that. And then he said, just keep coming. We're, we're going to see how it goes, but just keep coming unless I say otherwise. <laughs> 
So I, I was like, am I on a band? What's my status What's here? But I didn't, you know, I didn't ask him. Um, and I only knew that I was on the band after weeks, with even a few tours, when I was up at Mel's apartment, uh, probably collecting a check, but Mel is, loved to talk, and so any, any chance for, uh, you know, chatting. Mm -hmm. And so he told me more or less the, uh, the scenario of what's planned for the band, and after this whole long, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, and he said, you're gonna be there. And that's when I knew I was hired. <laughs> That's that, awesome. Now, uh, I read later that Brookmeyer, uh, in, in one of his blogs, he uh, kind of takes credit, you might say, for bringing me and Lovano and Tom Harrell onto the band. Really? Okay. So that was part of his tenure. Okay. And uh, I actually have a great Brookmeyer story. It's a little of a sidetrack. But since he was music director, uh, after the set or after the night, I would often go to him if and say, uh, if you have any tips or suggestions, you know, I'd love yeah, to hear any feedback. Yeah, yeah. And he was always, oh, sounds good, man. Like, oh, no, that's <laughs> but I kept needling him. I was bugging him, you know. And finally, he said, do you have a piano? I said, yeah. And we lived near each other. He was in Gramercy, and I was 16th and, uh, or 17th and 6th at the time. And uh, so he came over, and he sat down at my piano and started playing. And he played the piano for an hour, and I just stood over his shoulder and watched. And every now and then, he would say, you might want to check this out. <laughs> and then he played for a while, and said, you might want to check this out. And, and that was, it. and then he left, and that was that. You know, he's just showing wow. me his shit, basically. Uh -huh. It was all Brookmeyer, you know, uh -huh. that chromatic and polytonal, small interval kind of Brookmeyer stuff. Mm -hmm. you, know, you might want to check this out. <laughs> And essentially what he was telling me uh, was to stretch out more harmonically. Oh, okay. But he didn't say it that way. That's what I, that was my takeaway. Okay. And at the same time, around the same time, I took a lesson with Lehman, my only two jazz lessons in my life, and Lehman said more or less the same, mm -hmm. same thing to me. So that was the beginning of me harm exploring more complex or sophisticated harmonies or whatever. Mm -hmm. But anyway, going back to Mel's band, uh, like I said, this was absolute heaven. It was a great band, really great. And with filled, not only with great soloists, you know, Lovano and Tom Harrell was there in that day, at that time, and Kenny Garrett was playing alto when I joined, and of course, Dick Oates and, uh, and Mel, and then especially when Dennis Irwin came on, uh, it was first with McNeely and then Kenny Warner, with that rhythm section and Earl Gardner playing lead trumpet, we were this magical unit mm -hmm. uh, that I've never experienced since then, you know, to that level. Sure. We were like this organism that literally and figuratively were breathing together, you know. So the ensembles were just amazing, in large part to the way Mel played. I mean, just this amazing player. Um, but in between with all these incredible solos and stuff. Yeah. So, again, I was, I'm in heaven, you know. <laughs> I'm just sitting in the middle of this band with playing Brookmeyer and Thad Jones and, and it's just amazing experience. And then at the same time, as you, you said in the introduction, I was playing with the Ellington band. So I was surrounded with Thad Jones and Bob Brookmeyer on one hand and in those days, you could really juggle two or three bands at the same time, doing the Ellington band, playing Ellington and Strayhorn music, which is the other side of heaven, sure. you might say, or yeah. whatever, yeah. another department, yeah. and absorbing all of that. So this was just a fantastic uh, learning experience, learning, growing, on-the-job training, grooving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, we could spend so much time on New York, but we'll, and we'll come back to it a little bit, but... Uh, Let's talk about um, and thank you for talking to saying uh, to talking about Mel's situation because it was like I remember hearing the band at that time and just being blown away and when every it's every 
single player is making these amazing contributions as yeah. a soloist and then an ensemble like you described. I just um, played, I just started to interrupt, but no, I played a gig with Levano last week. We were in Budapest, Hungary together with, mm. with Peter Erskine. Oh yeah, I think I saw and, that. And uh, Budapest Jazz Orchestra. And Joe and I, we always talk about it when we're together about how magical that mm. that period was. You know, it's really everybody, I think everybody who heard it and everybody was certainly that experienced it in the band uh, has that kind of memories about it. Yeah. It's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. Well, talking about, about Europe, uh, you made in 1999, you made the move to, uh, to head over to Graz and uh, that fantastic program over there. You already, at least from what I could see, you already had a presence as a soloist and, uh, and, a, and a writer in Europe and doing your own projects. But uh, maybe talk a little bit about what made you make that move to Graz and, and how you... Uh, how you found the uh, the European scene? I know you're still over there a lot. I know you mentioned Budapest, and you also have an association with the Metropole and right. the various orchestras that you've worked with. But maybe uh, what made you make that move, and 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 how you how did you find the European scene in general? Uh, well, the the process started back in the early '90s, so it goes back actually to Brookmeyer um, and Mel and Kenny Warner and Levano. Uh, so my colleagues, my friends, I saw them going to Europe and doing projects. And small group and big band, WDR, the radio band in Cologne, Germany. A lot of people were going there. And so I, I'm sitting in my little second trombone chair going, uh, <laughs> I want to do that. <laughs> that looks like fun. <laughs> But I had, uh, you know, I toured in Europe, but always as a side man. I didn't really have any strong connections. So there was no opportunity until, again, it's like a magical day, uh, the band director from Denmark, a guy named Jens Kluver, uh, was in the Vanguard. And it was a set that featured me a lot. And, you know, big bands, it's not always the case. You never know. Maybe you get a solo, maybe not. Sure. But in this particular set, they played my arrangements. I had a solo, you know, so a little feature. And the guy came up and said, uh, I have a band in Denmark, and if you're ever in Europe, I would love to have you be a guest with the band. So I went home that night and flipped the calendars during paper calendars. I flipped it ahead six months, closed my eyes, put my finger on a date, and said, I'm going to be in Europe. <laughs> And I caught, or I sent him the letter. So I think this is even before fax, you know. It's, uh, and I just told him that. He booked me for three days, and then I asked him for suggestions about other people in the area to contact. And I did have some kind of connections that I reached out to, and that I parlayed that first European trip into a three-week tour. I was in Paris wow. and, and uh, Helsinki and all over Austria, Germany. That was the first year, and then because of the context, I started to, um, uh, what's the word, you know, pull together, uh, meet. Uh, I, I just kept, kept at it. Sure. You know, um, and kept peop in touch with people and people who would say, we can't do anything this time, but let us know, you know. And that just grew and grew. It's first, first year was that one three week tour, the next year I did two tours, the year after that, I think three. Uh, and a lot of touring as a musician, it's the same now, is you pick up some gigs, but uh, doing university work in between, you know, right. coaching or t lessons or doing a project with the big band, whatever. So, of course, that was part of my routine, my, my um, touring routine. And it started, I could start to see that a position could be offered to me. Um, mm -hmm. And it was already kind of in my mind, and I was, I was uh, in those days, I was traveling to Europe every month. Literally 12 times a year I was popping back and forth, doing something over there. And my work here, um, the commercial work was sort of, I didn't really have time for it, plus I, I really wanted to focus on my creative life. Um, that I, so I was teaching here and playing whatever gigs I could manage and still doing the vanguard and whatever else I could juggle, you know. Um, and then this professor, professorship opened up in Graz. And um, I remember this the IAJE conference in Miami. The guy came to me and he, 
he invited me to breakfast and he said, we have a new professorship, jazz trombone, would you consider considering it? <laughs> and so I said, well, um, possibly, let's discuss discussing it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, went on and on and ended up, they brought me as a guest professor and almost handed me the gig on a silver platter almost. It wow. still had to go through, I had to audition like everybody else. Mm -hmm. and, um, luckily for me, uh, there wasn't really any competition. Uh, and so I did, was offered a job and then I spent the next 15, 16 years teaching there. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, they were fortunate to get you. So the, that's an awesome thing. And, and did you find like, I would imagine that since you're in Europe, that it expanded the opportunities for you to, to well, this Work is as interesting. a solo artist, or uh, did you find that? Yes and no. Uh, for some, like the Budapest Jazz Orchestra, so I have a long time relationship with them, and I go to Budapest once or twice, sometimes even three times a year, and I conduct the band, or rehearse, conduct, and play solos with the band. Sometimes we do my music, sometimes it's somebody else's music. Okay. Uh, this has been going on for a good 10 years. That happened as a result that I was nearby. The Metropole... Uh, when I, I did projects with them, but I had already established that relationship from New York. Uh, interestingly, some of the clubs that I played at when I lived in New York, um, I never played again when I moved to. Oh, is that right? Yeah, well, well they didn't want to pay. They wanted to be paid me like a local guy. Oh, right. So all of a sudden, the certain aspect of status changed. And... Um, so it was okay, you know, it's like whatever, you know. Right, right. <laughs> but it was some places I used to play regularly, all of a sudden it was just a no-go, uh -huh. you know, and that's kind of interesting. Um, but I was uh, active, I stayed active, I want to say enough, but it wasn't enough. Uh, the playing part of my um, career, uh, as I got more and more into composition, became less and less and I it was it's, it's always a juggling act you know too of course um, but when I was freelancing in New York I could play the trombone a lot mm -hmm. now I'm teaching composing a lot but not playing the horn so much so when I had a gig which was always a feature solo gig I had to train for it like yeah. an athlete would train yeah. you know I would keep my chops kind of in the neighborhood, play with students and practice and keep it up as much as possible. But uh, is when, and the chance of a last minute gig like in New York, like, Ed, can you come here now? It doesn't really exist there. Right. So I always knew about the gigs ahead of time and then I would train for them. So that for me, that was a big um, uh, transition or adjustment. Uh, and it did change over time a little bit. And, but I, did, I didn't do a whole lot of freelancing with play with other people. Mm -hmm. A little bit, especially New York people that came over, Dave Liebman or Jim McNeely. Um, but the last six or seven years, I'm playing with a guitarist, a Viennese guitarist named uh, Carl Ratzer. And we still, uh, I, I'm going to go there in, in January. We have a tour and another one in the spring. So I'm playing nice. with him still. It's a great band. Um, and continuing the European presence from the New York base. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, you touched on it earlier, but let, let's, I love it because like this is like this journey through the whole, uh, your career has been fascinating to, to read about it and talk about it with you today. Let's talk about LA a little bit. I know in 2007, you, you moved, I know you mentioned you were still in Graz, but you made the commitment to go to LA and do work in film scoring, orchestrating and whatnot. Talk about, uh, Talk about that a little bit. That's a pretty big transition, I would, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, that was major, uh, um, but kind of inevitable somehow, you know. Uh, in addition to teaching uh, in Graz, the professor professorship there, I was also, uh, I designed the curriculum and was teaching uh, jazz composition in Lucerne, Switzerland. Oh, wow, okay. And that happened almost right away. So it's like, oh, Ed, you're in Europe. Can you, can you do this? We're... we're we're setting up a new composition program. Uh, they call it a graduate program. The level wasn't really that high, but it was good. And so I started this jazz composition program in Lucerne, Switzerland. I was teaching at both schools. 
After the composition program was growing, I needed to bring in another teacher. And there was a, there was a composer who was living nearby named David Angel. And he was a Hollywood ghostwriter for 30 years. And uh, I had met him and I brought him in to be the other teacher. We became fast friends, great, knowledgeable composer, also plays the saxophone. Um, and so I learned a lot about the Hollywood music scene mm -hmm. from him. He was working for everybody, you know, wow. ghostwriting mm -hmm. and orchestrating. Um, television and movies. And kind of through his influence, um, a couple of things happened, but uh, so I got, he retired from that teaching position and my, I had some personal changes in my life. So, uh, and he kind of ignited the fire of film scoring with something I was always interested in, but it was like the other thing about going to Europe, I didn't have any connections really. And I wasn't ready just to move to LA and jump headfirst into that. Mm -hmm. um, but through his influence kind of, and he, I, I kind of took some lessons, basic uh, film scoring lessons from him. I went to uh, L.A. and pursued that hmm. and, and started a big band there. Um, and I wrote a few film scores, uh, some little things, um, but uh, the big sort of uh, work was uh, orchestrating for Hans Zimmer. Mm -hmm. And that came about through Bruce Fowler, another great trombonist. Uh, yeah. Uh, An orchestrator as well, right? And he's the lead orchestrator for, for Hans Zimmer. Oh, okay. And we became good friends and we played together and he played in my band and we just, yeah, we hit it off really well. And so he brought me in to that world, orchestrating. Nice, okay. For the big, and did. So I got a chance to work on these big Hollywood movies. It was really great. That's very cool. And learn about orchestration more and, um, and a lot of other things you know, about how it was put together and also score layout and all these uh, so orchestrators. Uh, that score that the orchestrator submits is the final score. There's no time for a copyist to go over it and fix it. Mm -hmm. You know, they're busy doing the parts. And so the scores have to be pristine. Yeah. Um, and so I learned a lot about that. And this is what I'm passing on to my students, my co composing students. With, you know, a beautiful looking score just sounds better. Yeah. You know, it's going to be better because it's, it looks good. If, if that makes any sense whatsoever. It does make total sense. I know exactly what you're talking about. And uh, it's funny, I had one experience working for Bruce Fowler. We came to New York and I don't think I've ever met a more relaxed guy <laughs> in the studio. He was just fantastic. And yeah. just was not going to get flustered by whatever needed to be done, just like a consummate professional. That's so I Bruce, imagine that's yeah. a... Yeah, uh, great experience. Let's shift gears a little bit and and talk a lot, you know, more about your your work as a solo artist. You have uh, you've had various ensembles over the years. We were talking about the New Hat Ensemble at yeah. the New Meister Jazz Orchestra. Um, I know you're in, it's a collaborative effort, the Improvisatory Minds that you have going now, and right. and of course your other groups are still going. Seven albums or or give or take one yep. or two yep. as a, as a leader and a solo artist. Um, talk a little bit about that, where you're going with that, and uh, and and how you you know maybe how that how how that kind of ignites your whole. Uh, seems like that kind of is the thread that runs through all of these uh, changes yeah, that you've had over the years. Well, it sure does. Um, you know, I always uh, I always strived to be a creative solo artist uh, with a unique voice. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I. Something I teach now to be, you know, mindful and to, to really know what you're focused on rather than just hoping for the best, you know. Um, but I had this and um, this drive from the San Francisco days and maybe it started in Amsterdam too because I, that was all creative music I was playing in Amsterdam. Um, and I've just been pursuing that uh, all this time. Mm -hmm. And... When my playing, my trombone playing got to a certain level, technically, um, I realized that I needed to focus more on composition and bring that in, that aspect in. 
and it was I so I I joined the BMI Jazz Composers Workshop. This was the very first year. Bob Brookmeyer and Manny Album. Manny Album was also a neighbor and almost like family. That came later. Uh, I, I shouldn't say almost like family. He was family. He had, him and his wife had dinner, Christmas dinner at our house. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, what a great soul. That yeah. Um, great people. And studying composition with them and also Bill Fendigan a little bit, uh, my focus moved from being a trombone player who composes into being a composer whose instrument is the trombone. Mm. And I realized soon that even though I was playing the horn less, my playing was getting better because oh. I was focused more on the, the actual composition, the, the, the music. And so this was a great sort of revelation. And that has continued really till now. I just keep exploring, looking for um, other, other avenues of expression and uh, musical and um, same thing, I'm practicing now more and more than I have because I have a little more time for that and I'm to keep the, the, the composing going. So it's, this has been just a drive that this continued. I, when I moved to New York, I took, or soon after, I consciously stopped lift, listening to trombone players. Mm. So I, I went from hardly buying a recording without a trombone player <laughs> to consciously not you know, of course, I'm on gigs and I'm hearing guys and I'm playing with Curtis Fuller or whatever. Sure. And going out and hearing music. But I was not <laughs> transcribing anymore or really checking out anybody closely, any trombonist. But I was checking out Freddie Hubbard and McCoy Tyner and Herbie Hancock and Tony Williams and Elvin Jones and all the heavy masters in the jazz world at the same time studying modern classical music and studying those heavy guys. Mm -hmm. Uh, studying the scores, listening to recordings, and uh, that's the, you might say, the evolution of the style that I have right now. Yeah, it seems like you've always been a, a mixture of uh, all these, you know, I don't know the best way to describe it. Maybe it's not meant to be described. It's just like <laughs> all these, you know, you know, from an early on, you know, you're playing with Jerry Garcia one night in the San Francisco Symphony the next night, but now it's evolved to the point where you're uh, you know, creative solo artist on your own as a composer and and uh, and as a trombonist, and uh, it's great and it's great to to uh, to see. You know, one thing I found fascinating uh, in looking on your website and checking out all the cool stuff that you got on there is is your work as a conductor. And I know oh, yeah. you're doing, and I it made me think about it. It's like because jazz, you know, you don't think about a conductor as much as you would certainly in classical music. But you know, when you look back at uh, at in Thad and Mel's band, you know, and Thad standing in front of the band. You can see the videos on YouTube. Uh, his impact as a conductor, obviously his impact as a ranger is incredible, right. but his impact as a conductor, he's really like giving so much music without, just from his conducting, you yep. know, to my, to my way of thinking. Um, talk a little bit about that, because I know you, you've you done a lot of conducting with different groups, and uh, in addition, to, I think the fact that you write for so many different instruments, you've written for orchestra, you've written for strings, winds, et cetera, et cetera, but, but um, just from that kind of perspective, it's an additional thing that, that maybe wouldn't get talked about that much. Yeah, I, I, it started out conduct, well, in these tours I had to conduct the big bands because I'm the guest artist. Um, I never had the opportunity to play with Thad, so I got to see him when I was on Mel's band, Thad was leading the Basie band, and we mm -hmm. a couple times we were on the same festival. Um, and I got, so I got to know him a little bit and hang with him a little bit, traveling in an airport here and there. But my, most of my uh, conducting uh, education is from classical mm -hmm. orchestras mm -hmm. and, and some maybe... Um, some shows, you know. And so I try to bridge that gap. And uh, in a jazz band, most jazz music, a conductor is almost redundant. You know, mm -hmm. you don't need mm -hmm. to give the beat. Mm -hmm. And the job really is rehearsing the band. And then somebody like that, he would accentuate the dynamic. So that's what I try to do, you mm -hmm. know. Okay. Rather than just giving a pulse, I mean, you don't need that unless the drums, drums stop playing for some reason. And so it's really about rehearsing, and I've become a real student of rehearsal technique, and I'm sure you know uh, 
there's never enough rehearsal time, so you have to take advantage of every second. Sure, yeah, that's for sure. Um, and especially when there's a budget, you know, and that clock is ticking, um, every second counts. So not only as an arranger composer, being really clear, and so there's no questions or very few as a conductor. Um, and then through this conducting uh, school bands and professional bands, I've developed what I call signals, and so I conduct improvisations. And I bring, it's written into some of my pieces, and sometimes I just do a whole piece, which is called signals. And so there's nothing notated, but I'm giving the band signals, long note, short note, play busy, oh, wow. play okay. pointillistic, uh, sometimes I give them a key, sometimes not. And um, they learn my signals, and so I can, it's more like sound painting in a way. Uh, and I've brought that into my repertoire, shall we say. And I like to include that, too. So it's a combination of all these things. Mm -hmm. And when the music is more, even if it's jazz, but I, I, write, I like to write mixed meters. So it's, and I even have pieces in 1716 and 13-8, and, you know, and it's moving from one to the next, to the next, to the next. So there you need a conductor just to help everybody and sure. give the downbeats <laughs> and everything. Uh, so there I, I revert to real classical, and uh, I studied with uh, jo Thom Joel Thom, who was Brookmeyer's conducting teacher. Oh, really? Wow. And so through Brookmeyer, uh, and I got some really good advice from him, um, and it, I kind of took to it. It came pretty easy, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I think one of the first times I conducted was one of the BMI jazz things, jazz composer workshop concerts. And uh, everybody complimented me on my conducting. And what I did to prepare is I stood in front of the mirror and I conducted the piece over and over again. Okay. So I came prepared. You know? Yeah. What a concept. <laughs> <laughs> There's no substitute for preparation. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, as cliche as that sounds, I mean, you know, opportunity comes along and people tell, say it's luck or whatever you want to call it. But if, if, you, if the preparedness is not there, then forget it. It yeah. doesn't matter what, what yeah. gets presented to That's you. That's right. Um, Ed, as we wind down here, this has been awesome. I've been had, had a blast uh, just hearing about your uh, the journey that you've been on in creative music and what you've been able to do uh, and, and give back to the music. It's been uh, astounding. Um, tell us a little bit about your upcoming projects and also what's, you know, having been, I mean, you've done it, everything in the music world, but you've, I, I consider you a jazz musician, a composer in, the, in that primarily, but, you know, in mu creative music I might, may be a better way of describing it. How do you see the future of that music? With everything that's going on in the world now, the, the support for the arts and everything, not to get into a whole, we could have an hour-long discussion on Just that. Just on for that, sure. right. But, but what's your overall outlook as a, as a creative person and then also as with your own individual projects? Well, first, uh, as, as far as the overall outlook, I'm a little bit What's the word? Uh, I could even say prejudice, you know, because I just moved back to New York after being in Europe for more than 15 years. And uh, it was really great to get away from New York in many ways because I come back on the scene with fresh everything, mm -hmm. fresh eyes, fresh ears, and the usual hunger just to uh, get motivated and to get inspired. And so I love the scene here in New York, that uh, any given night I can go to one or two or three concerts that are interesting for me. Mm -hmm. uh, classical and or jazz, or whatever, world. And I, uh, I think there's a lot of creative things going on, much of it focused here. There's a lot of great things going on everywhere, but somehow New York is the hub of, of musical creative life, I think. Um, and so for me, this is very exciting. I'm, um, as far as my own thing, I have two or three recordings, I want to say in the pipeline, but it's a, kind of a loose pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> as it always is for everybody. <laughs> yeah. right? uh, so I have projects lined up, uh, I'm a solo recording that I'm working on, uh, uh, a small group recording, another large ensemble. I have some Metropole recordings that I would like to get released. Oh, wow, cool. 
that's really been on my to-do list for way too many years now. Uh, so there's a lot of these sort of business aspects uh, that I want to get uh, working on. Mm -hmm. I'm enjoying being in New York. I'm teaching in a couple different schools, so I, I have um, enough to do here. I've, the gigs that I've been getting called for so far have been just fantastic. I played with Jay Clayton and George Cables a couple weeks ago at Catano. I'm playing with Joe Lovano next week at Birdland. I played with John Beasley's Monk Orchestra. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, the Vanguard Band, they bring me in every now and then, uh, the sub. And more and more, I, I see it's kind of growing. So um, I'm looking forward to everything that happens, whatever that may be. You know? yeah. In the meantime, I just keep composing and playing and uh, developing my everything. Yeah. yeah, well, we appreciate it as a as a fan and as a colleague. Uh, we appreciate everything you've uh, given to the music and to the trombone. And uh, uh, one last question, Ed, and and I know you share this knowledge with your and your insights with your students all the time. But we have a lot of young folks who tune into our series, and uh, and I always kind of like to an artist of your stature, at, you know, let you just what for somebody who wants to be a creative musician. What what's your uh, one or two pieces of advice you might give? <laughs> <laughs> well, the short, obvious answer is Mary Rich. <laughs> it's good advice. It's good advice. Hard, hard to accomplish sometimes. Hard to accomplish, but, uh, <laughs> and sometimes we especially with the trombone. But uh, <laughs> but don't be don't be dis don't be discouraged. But the, lo the, the longer answer uh, <laughs> is uh, for the creative will only really work in the marketplace if you're a good businessman. Mm, okay. And you know this as well as anybody, I would say, um, because kudos to you and everything you're doing. You're Thank doing you. great work in all these regards. Uh, we can be the most creative player in the world, but if nobody hears you, nobody's going to care. And we have to realize that we are not only a creative artist or whatever, however you want to describe yourself, but we are the publicist, we're a manager, we're an agent. We're the house cleaner sometimes, <laughs> whatever else. Like collection <laughs> agency. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think, especially younger musicians, they, uh, they sleep on this a little bit, you know. And um, the other thing that I think is really important is that if there's somebody that you would like to perform with, whoever that may be, and assuming that you're capable of it, uh, then let them know. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's a band, if there's a rehearsal band in town or a band that plays Monday nights in your town or once a month or whatever, and that's something you would really love to do, and you are capable of it, you know, you're at the level that, so you don't crash and burn, uh, go tell the band leader. And if you're a trombonist, go tell the other trombonist that you would love to sub, you know, and by expressing interest, then that can open doors. Mm -hmm. And just sitting at home, there used to be a phone that you look at, but now I don't know what it is. <laughs> uh, then it's going to be difficult. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's the basic. That's great kind of advice. Stuff. Thank you for uh, sharing that. Ed, this has been a blast. Thank you so much for uh, You're welcome. Thank the, you. the time and having us in. This is incredible. You guys can't see it, but it's an amazing view right here. But uh, at any rate, uh, thanks everybody for joining us this time on Bone to Pick. I hope you guys enjoyed this as much as I did, and we will see you next month.